Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. And I'm, I'm sorry for the slight delay, and I hope that we do have an online um, Zoom audience um, as well. Um, but of course, we have a wonderful um, um, in-person audience here. So welcome to this um, event, uh, Finding the Snake Goddess, New Poems by Ruth Bedell. And I'd like to um, start by thanking Fiona McIntosh for accommodating this event uh, within the APGRD uh, schedule. And also Charlotte Medlin, Marcus Bell, um, Claire Kenwood and Fliss McDowell uh, for the, their support behind the scenes. Um, I'm Andrew Shapland, I'm the uh, um, curator of the current Ashmolean uh, exhibition, uh, Labyrinth, Knossos, Myth and Reality. And I just wanted to provide a very brief introduction to this event. And also I wanted to make it clear that I claim no credit at all for most of what you're about to see on um, this wonderful project, except that I did provide um, access to the Ashmolean um, collection. So actually the many lives of a snake goddess is the brainchild of, of three people who join us today. Um, Ellen Adams, who's reader in classical archeology span and liberal arts at King's College London. Uh, Christine Morris, who's Andrew A. David professor in Greek archeology span and history at Trinity College Dublin and Nico Mimigliano, who is Professor of Aegean Studies at the University of Bristol. And then one of the strands of this uh, project, uh, which you'll hear more about, was the commissioning of poems by the renowned uh, poet and author Ruth Fidel, who's also, of course, an Oxford uh, Classics alumna, having studied here both as an undergraduate and then as a DPhil student. Um, but because of the clear um, synergy between um, this uh, project and the exhibition, we wanted to have an event in Oxford and we even shamelessly borrowed uh, Ruth um, to read one of her poems um, on the audio guide um, in the exhibition in front of the stop for the snake goddesses here. Now you might notice that these aren't the real snake goddesses. Heraclea Museum were very clear from the start that I wasn't to ask for them <laughs> because they weren't going to uh, lend them. Um, but these are the next best um, thing really. Uh, and if you haven't been to the exhibition yet, um, well it's on until the end of July, so I do encourage you to um, go and I hope today's event also encourages you to go. And today we will um, hear the full sequence of Ruth's um, Snake Goddess poems. Um, but before that, Nico and Christine uh, will give an introduction to the Knossos Snake Goddesses and the, the project um, in general, in order to provide a, a context ready for the poems. And then we'll follow that with a discussion in, involving questions from um, the audience um, and a discussion between those involved in, in the project. And um, all we ask for you in return is that uh, before you go for your tea and cake, um, please do um, think about filling in a questionnaire um, either on paper here uh, at the front um, or on your phones, we'll provide a QR code. Um, so the tea and cake will be in about an hour and a half's um, time. Um, but now I'll hand over to Nico and Christine for their introduction. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, everybody who is here. Can you hear me? Okay, and of course, above all, thank you to Fiona McIntosh, the director of the Archive of Performances of Greek and Roman Drama, for helping us to have this event here um, in, in Oxford and then for inviting members of the Many Lives of the Snakes Goddess project to provide a brief introduction to Ruth Padel's readings of her new poems. These poems are inspired by the snake goddess figurines discovered by Sir Arthur Evans at Knossos and are a commissioned part of the project. And very appropriately, uh, Ruth Padel's reading takes place in conjunction with the current exhibition in the Ashmolean Museum, Labyrinth, Knossos, Myth and Reality, curated by Andrew, and which is open until the 30th of July where, as Andrew has just said, replicas of the figurines are on display and you can hear one of Ruth's poems about, among the audio recordings that accompany the exhibition. Now, as shown in the Labyrinth exhibition, the long-standing fascination with the myth of the Labyrinth and the legendary King Minos built and the uh, labyrinth and built to house his stepson, the Minotaur. This was one of the catalysts that led to the excavations of Knossos, first in 1878 by the aptly named Minos Kalokainos, and from 1900 to 1931, most famously by Sir Arthur Evans. Well, although Evans 
did not find the remains of the Minotaur, his excavations brought up other spectacular finds, including many representations of bulls and objects in precious or semi-precious materials, as illustrated here by the so-called Toreador fresco and the snake goddess figurines, which have captured the imagination of specialists and non-specialists alike since the early 1900s. I mean, for some of you, this will be very well known, but we can't assume that everybody will know about the history of the discovery of the figurines. I'll say a few words about this. As I said, he found the figurines during the 1903 campaigns at Knossos. Uh, these objects are, um, were found broken and incomplete inside two cysts, which were dubbed by Evans the temple repositories. The cysts were hidden under a paved floor in a room somewhere here to the south of the so-called throne room in the west wing of the monumental structure, usually referred to as a palace, although the term palace is now a bit contentious. The cysts contained fragments of another three or four figurines, so there would have been in total about five or six originally. And they were found together with many other finds, such as dozens of clay vases, like the ones you can see in this slide. Besides the faience figurines and clay vases, other finds from the cysts included hundreds of shells, clay seal impressions, clay objects inscribed in linear A, one of the scripts used by the Minoans, animal bones, charcoal, objects made of marble and other precious or semi-precious materials, as well as other objects made in vitreous substances, faience and frit, including plaques depicting dresses like this, interpreted as votive robes and suckling animals. The character of these finds their careful placement inside the cysts in separate layers in a kind of structured deposition and also the evidence, some evidence of burning, all suggested that these were the furnishings of a destroyed shrine whose sanctity required special disposal. And this is why Evans dubbed the cysts the temple repositories. And in this image, you can see how Evans used a selection of finds to illustrate how he thought the shrine might have been arranged. Now, Evans discovered fragments belonging to several figurines, but he was able to reconstruct fully only these two. He called one of the figurines the goddess because of her larger size and headgear, and dubbed the other the votary. A Danish artist, Halvard Bakke, who worked at Knossos between 1903 and 1905, reconstructed them in two stages. The first was immediately after their discovery in 1903, as can be gathered from photographs published at the time, such as this one. And um, the second stage occurred sometime between 1903 and 1905, uh, and he then Bagger restored the left arm of the votary, her entire face, and also added this strange headgear and feline on top. Now, Bagger's reconstruction processes were never fully documented, making it difficult to distinguish now what is original and what is modern. Nevertheless, archival documents and illustrations in Evans's publications show that, for example, not only the head of the votary and her left arm are entirely modern, but so is much of the skirt of the goddess. Moreover, it is by no means certain that the headgear of the votary and the feline sitting on top belong together. 
let alone that they belong to the votary, since her original head has not survived. And some scholars have even suggested that the original and much restored item held in the votary's right hand is not a snake because it has a textured and spirally striped appearance and this is not serpent-like. It could be a rope or even a bow made from the horns of an ibex. But despite their debatable restorations and other changes in their appearance, such as their color, ideas about these figurines are usually based on the assumption that they originally appeared as we see them today. And we can see this in many examples of modern reimaginations and performances of the snake goddess. And we also note that over time, the votary has become a goddess. And she is the real poster girl for Minoan Crete, since it is her image that is most often reproduced in a wide variety of media. She even took pride of place in the parade of Greek history in the opening ceremony of the Athens Olympics in 2004, as shown here. And now I invite my colleague, Christine Morris, to show you more examples of performances and modern reimaginations of the snake goddess. Christine, thank you. Over to you. Okay, thank you. One of the aims of our Many Lives of a Snake Goddess project is the documentation and contextualization of the diverse reuses and recreations of the figurines. For example, by artists, writers, psychoanalysts, feminists, fashion designers, followers of modern neo-paganism, among others, all of whom have reimagined these iconic objects for their own purposes. Some examples from poetry and art appear on the slide here, but for the context of our event today, we focus on snake goddesses as seen are interpreted in performance. The staging of ancient Greek tragedies and other works inspired by mythological narratives offers a rich vein of snake goddess reimaginings. And we gratefully acknowledge here today that some of the research shown here was facilitated by the resources provided by the archive of performances of Greek and Roman drama. In this slide, you see some examples taken from costumes designed for the 1910 London performance of Richard Strauss's opera Electra and for Henry Jules Bois's drama La Furie premiered in Paris in 1909, a drama loosely based on Euripides' Magnus and Heracles. The use of Minoan elements for these performances represents a way for artists to show their sophistication and striving for authenticity. They use Minoan elements to indicate that the stories depicted in these works were set not in classical Athens, but in a much more distant mythological past, going back to the second millennium BCE. This also reflected the innovative character of these performances, influenced by contemporary early modernism with its interests in more primitive and exotic arts and reactions against classicism. Another Minoan and modernist example of this is the performance of U Ripides Medea, premiered in Stockholm in 1934, as shown in the photographs to the left. But the staging of Minoan elements and of the snake goddess in particular has continued well into the 21st century. And one of the things we're doing in this project is creating a, a database, a collection um, of uh, these examples. And we have 300 uh, items already in the database. And this is illustrated here to the right by the gigantic snake priestess used by Harrison Birtwistle in his opera Minotaur, premiered at Covent Garden in 2008. Okay. 
In this example, from modern American dance, Ted Sean of the Stella Sean Dance Company performs Gnossienne, which he also choreographed. As the Knossian priest, whose costume was inspired by Minoan frescoes, and um, here to the right you see the, the coloured photograph um, from the archive of costumes, he dances in the presence of the snake goddess. And obviously you can't see a snake goddess because the snake goddess dominates with her altar, but they're off stage. Um, and so she's still the powerful focus of his dance and his movements, his stylized movements, which are technically very difficult um, to perform, suggest both supplication to and resistance against the goddess. Another powerful and recent reimagining of the snake goddess was created by Marina Abramovich in her performance art piece seen here at the opening of her The Biography Remix in 2005. There's no attempt, of course, to copy the details of the elaborate flounced Minoan costume, but the bare breasts and the brandished snakes capture the essence of the figure art for this artist, who interestingly also has incorporated snakes into quite a lot of her other art performances, so presumably the snake goddess has spoke to her in a multiplicity of ways. We, it's recorded that growling sounds from the loudspeakers as part of the display cause the snakes to become agitated, and the performance has been described by those reviewing it as, quote, very beautiful, terribly intimate, and perfectly universal, end quote. So to pull things um, together in this brief introduction, nowadays, millions of people have encountered the reconstructed figurines in the Heraclean Museum and their images in other media from the replicas on display in the Ashneolian Museum through to modern murals, novels, poetry, fashion accessories, and even video games. But despite their iconic status, relatively few people realise that many aspects of the snake goddesses remain uncertain, ambiguous and problematic, from what they really looked like to their impacts beyond archaeology. So our project highlights this and tackles these issues using a three-pronged approach or tactic based on archaeology, reception studies and a multi-sensory approach, all in dialogue with each other. So, for example, through archaeology, we explore issues such as the figurine's original appearance and their symbolism, and this interacts with their reception and the multi-sensory aspects of the project. Through reception, we explore the impact of the figures beyond and far beyond archaeology and the dynamics between specialists and non-specialists in the production and transmission of knowledge about the figurines to wide audiences. And as we've seen in this talk, the figurines have provided inspiration for a wide range of performances from drama to ballet and opera and of course poetry as we shall soon see and experience. Our third tactic involves the commissioning of writers and other specialists including people with sensory impairments to develop their own readings of these objects in a multi-sensory approach. This is partly illustrated in the booklet, which you should find on your seats, which you're very welcome to take home with you. And in the booklet, you'll find four different genres and styles of English to help you to engage differently with the figurines. So thinking beyond the visual and seeing. Carly Allen's audio description of one figurine, so the, the goddess, the larger one, provides access for blind and partially sighted people. Second, Lucia van der Drift's piece on mindful looking applies mindfulness techniques to the figurines. And third, as we are keen to give voice and agency to those with sensory impairments, we commissioned the blind writer Tanvia Bush to share reflections from her perspective. In her pieces, she explores the process of piecing together meaning from surviving fragments, just like archaeologists do, while dealing with the brain's desperate and doomed attempts to make sense by generating hallucinations. And this is from um, a syndrome called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Last but not least, you will find Ruth Adele's poems. And each of these commissions then and recreations have brought for all of us, new insights into how these figurines may be seen, 
sensed and interpreted. But today, the focus is solely on Ruth and her wonderful poems. She's in the unique position of having excavated on Crete and knows the culture, its people and history of the island extremely well. Her poems engage closely with the archaeology of the figurines, which we've just tried to introduce briefly here, and also speaks from personal uh, memory. We now invite her to present her poems. Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> Can you all hear me okay? Is this, this the right thing? Um, it's wonderful to be here, and um, there's so much resonance for me in, in seeing all of you and being here, and also thinking of Knossos. So, as far as I'm concerned, when I got this extraordinary commission, um, and we've turned up the screen, so there are the life-size um, um, statuettes, made for Nico Mimigliano. And um, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's all about interpretation. And indeed, classics is all about interpretation. And um, as you know, I'm not telling you anything. And um, my father was a psychoanalyst. And when I was doing my PhD, I went to the British School of, of Archaeology at Athens, <clears throat> not because I was working on anything you could hold in your hand, but because I had a scholarship to go somewhere and I really wanted to see Greece. And um, they sent me, and this was one of the most important sort of shaping moments of my life, they sent me to the trench at Knossos. Um, they were, they were look, it was a sort of rest, not rescue, but looking back over Pendlebury's time there. And um, so I learned Greek from the workmen in that trench at Knossos. Um, <laughs> much to the distress of my Athenian friends who didn't approve. Um, and of course, this is about the interpretation of Evans and what he did. And I'm thinking not just of the what he did to the snake goddesses, but what he did to the palace there. I'm, I'm assuming that most of you know the palace or the so-called palace at Knossos. I'm also assuming that perhaps some of you may not know the dig house, which was on the site of the Villa Ariadne, which Evans built there when he started digging. <clears throat> and um, there was a little cottage which Evans turned into a place where people could stay. And when I first got to know Nikos and, and Nicoletta and Ellen and Christine, it was extraordinary to me that we were, had all stayed at separate times at that dig house. And um, you know, it was planted in the spring with daffodils by by British Evans. So it's a very evocative place of the British in in Knossos, really. And I went back there, having not lived, stayed there for 40 years. I went back there last September to to um, to re-see it. And I was thinking about what it is to interpret. And I found Nicoletta's book is wonderful. If you haven't read it, the book about Minoan Crete and the influence of Minoan Crete, particularly on the late 19th century and 20th century art is, is just extraordinary. Um, so that's got into it too. And because my dad was a psychoanalyst, there's a sort of, I'm afraid there's Jung rather than Freud in here, but um, you'll, you'll find him too. But I start from imagining Evans. And those those on that little diagram of the palace, you know, the those two cysts were were um over were, were sort of cemented or something over. So there was stone over them. He had to take it off. And he thought he was done for the season and then he took it off. One more thing which somebody else pointed out to me. I don't know if I don't know if my colleagues are going to like this. How fake are these goddesses? Because I don't think I'm right in saying that nothing like them has turned up on any other Minoan site. So who invented them? Just leave you with that thought. <clears throat> there are 15 poems here. And um, afterwards, I hope we'll all, we'll all sit up there 
and um, have questions because I thought the labyrinth um, exhibition in the Ashmolean was really the most imaginative, you know, beginning with Minos and the labyrinth and ending with a video game is just sort of sums up Nicoletta's book really that Minoan Crete arriving at the at turn at the beginning of the century changed everything. One. Sometimes a goddess is a second thought. Some things you only find beyond the light. You have cleared corridors, given the world a new world to think with, new script alongside the dawn. You have dug out the entire Western wing and think you are done. But something turning in your blood calls you to check under the gypsum paving beside steps to the hall of the jewel fresco the spot you intend to call the pillar crypt to discovery lift the lid and you find soft sift of burnt earth Brush it away. The Cretan sun touches shells, lots of shells, carefully arranged. It is all very careful. Separate layers, like a trousseau. Red soil trickles through your fingers. Fifty vases, carbonized corn, splinters of ivory, gold foil, rock crystal. Small clay plaques, like cut-out biscuits, shaped as women's dresses, flying fish, an ibex suckling a kid. Below, slowly now, you see glazed fragments of luxury faience, enough to make two, maybe three, female statuettes. Full skirts like long, important bells. Bare breasts, very bare, tightly bound by a bodice of snakes. A bodice of snakes. The new century blinks. <coughs> the goddess waits like a taproot in the deepest lair of the Cretan earth. And of the psyche. Three, she comes to you broken. You have been expecting her. Under the royal throne and double axes, look, divinity, earth mother, mistress of animals, the great goddess, small, primeval. When you fit the pieces together, chipped, flaky as a chapped lip, there is a hole where her waist should be. Waking from millennia under the ground, her form is incomplete, as it should be at first. We remake her each our own way, but her face is calm, and a snake, messenger of renewal, crawls up her moon-coloured arm. Four. Evening in the garden of the Villa Ariadne. Luminous fret of pink cloud. Lemon glow behind black pines. He has found her missing waist as if he dreamed it up, as if his imagination, not the pickaxe, spade and little trowel, lifted this magical civilization into the light. He pictures black flames zigzagging over exquisite cloth where she lay in burnt soil. Surely a shrine, surely destroyed in a fire. 
not where her image stood, an open lily welcoming devotees, but a treasury, things kept because they were holy. Five, like taking in your blood the mysteries, sorry, like taking in your hand the mysteries under the earth. Take it, I'm giving it to you. I heard the voice as I went out into the night garden of the dig house. The white cat that ate a snake the day I arrived, they curled on a chair outside the screen door, like thoth at the entrance to a tomb. And at the empty trestle table, ghosts, lovers, dancers, passionate scholars, resistance fighters, seekers after truth. When I stepped into the circle of light, they moved away. The full moon above the pine trees was translucent blue-green, like the quartz paste mystery shards of the goddess, fired to vitreous luster. Six, imagining the sign for snake in linear A. Now, as you know, or I'm sure most of you know, um, there were two scripts found in by Evans, and indeed by Minus um, Kalakalinos um, before him. And um, one was in, deciphered as, as Greek by Michael Ventris in 1956, linear B, but linear A we still don't know. So this poem is in the shape of imagining what the sign for snake would look like in linear A. At the center of the coil is the drop of wisdom. The serpent shows us the way to hidden things, expresses libido, which leads a man to go beyond the point of safety. Some of that is already Jung is getting in here. <laughs> now, this one is very much thinking about the goddess, the one with the tall hat, who has snakes down her arm. And perhaps I ought to say at this point that I, I, as, it, as it happens, I have gone out with the, a, a tribe in south of Chennai in India um, who catch snakes for the venom farm in Chennai, which they, they milk the snake for poison and then let it go mm. after a month. So they showed me how to catch a non-venomous snake. Um, and I was very interested to see that actually she's holding the snake very carefully, just as the Irula did with a head, a thumb sort of sensibly on its head so it can't turn and bite you. When a man looks at a woman wrapped in snakes, the first snake lifts its head from her crown, like the top jewel of a tiara, slithers down cheek and breast to a knotted fist above her belly, where the second snake joins in, looping down in a parabola, turning above her vulva, to follow the intimate shaping uterus, vagina, fallopian tubes, as if Whoever is manufacturing her knows that everything female, outside and in, is ripple and flow, and curves on upwards, cupping her breast like the edge trim of a bolero, folding its tail over her ear. The third snake, the longest, hangs down her back like a lariat in the rough shape of Africa. She is holding its head, folding her thumb, no fear of a bite, over the neck behind the skull. The dappled body flows along her arms like the twisted horn handle of a knife. The tail coils around her wrist. She bends her fingers. It cannot escape. She's an expert in control, holding out her arms as if in display. There is a lot of as if. He 
strokes the iridescent glaze, like touching a peeled fleck of sky dulled by the crusty of earth. Here she is, reaching out to offer the miraculous revelation, his faith in a single great mother goddess. A cry he has kept inside him all his life. So we move from Evans's interpretation to my own <coughs> extremely limited experience of holding a wild snake. And, and this poem too is, is in a, a, a shape. Eight, how snake wrangling feels in the wild. Let it flow said my guide from the Irilla, people of the dark. Let it ribbon and stream through your hands. Don't clutch, it will turn and bite. Its reptile brain wants to keep moving. Never mind that it never goes anywhere. He scooped a slim bronze checkered snake from the roots of a banyan tree, rippled it through his hands as if it were raw silk. He smiled, he loved it. He poured it like a sleeve of gold into my hands. It felt heavier than I expected. A smooth thread of almost warm steel, flowing, searching, like the memory of a lost relationship with the earth, but so calm. Nine, the votary. And this, this poem, now we're, we're moving to the, the smaller one, the votary, um, has a, a, an epigraph from Carl Jung. Why did I behave as if that serpent were my soul? Only, it seems, because my soul was a serpent. He waves a small figure in his hands. No head. No left arm, just the lux and curve of swelling hips, corsetry, blurt of bare breasts, a body of honey unfurling in seven flounces. Provocative, not maternal, not the goddess herself. He imagines her clicking, rustling as she moves, like a ballerina revolving on a musical box, little shimmers peeling her skirt. Men see what they want. He sees a girl holding a striped wavy stick, a ribbon, a garland, an ibex horn, Ariadne's thread, proclaiming a safe route through the maze of sexuality. Enough! He is sure it is a snake. He is in love with powers of the goddess, fertility, danger, poison and cure. This is her votary. He will remake her, give her the face of a wild queen bee, a mad coronet, a fascinator that doesn't belong, guarded by a leopard and another snake, identical. She's brandishing two now, two whips of ink, delicate as icicles banded and barred as the deadliest Indian crate. In her reconstructed gaze, he reads the music of dead stars. 10, the enchantment. This is from the Et English Etymological Dictionary. Fascinate derives from the divine phallus Baskinum, a magic charm to ward off evil from boys and conquering generals. And the verb fascinare, to bewitch, to use the power of the fascinum. Sex and physic and poison. Kiss of the lamia, entice and repel. In Vienna, the goddess of health or maybe death, 
in her red gold shawl with her golden snake has offered or is she withholding a chalice in paris jeanne avril so supple she can bend back touching the floor with her shoulders raises her arms afraid or in playful surrender to a serpent coiled up as slender black dress in crete he wakes to a red gold dawn he loves boys but is enthralled to the spell of woman and snake Eleven, looking at Cranach's Eve, I think of my new Medusa Christmas tree ornament. And this too has a, a epigraph from Jung, the daimon of sexuality approaches our soul as a serpent. And the painting I have in mind is Cranach's Adam and Eve, which is in the Courthouse Gallery. And I really did find a Medusa Christmas tree ornament, which is, but it's not at all like Medusa. I mean, it just, it's exactly like a, a snake goddess with crossover things and the green of holly. So it's a ridiculous thing. Um, the apples are glowing rose gold, as perfectly round as her head. She's gazing down at the one she has plucked to offer a naked man. Their fingers twine around it. It is already in his palm, and the two top tines of a roebuck's antlers, the first stag in Eden, looking at its own reflection in a pool, as stags do, frame thick leaves hiding the join of his thighs. The world rears its glory. She holds a low branch, as if she is a part of all this nature and of the tree rooted between them. The apples are round as her white breasts or the little black grapes dangling in V-shaped bunches from the vine throwing tendrils across her thighs. Those apples are radioactive, ripe orange as the belly of the lion crouching beside her or the blonde hair glowing on her scalp. But out of sight, behind her head, those twisty locks escape and go wild, spraying out in all directions, not gold at all, just pure ripple, like the dappled snake coiling down from a high branch, pointing its dark head at hers. Twelve. What do you do with the palace of yourself? And this has got, it's got an epigraph from Borges. His, his story, his <coughs> fable about the Minotaur, um, the house of Asterion. Asterion was a name for Minos' stepson. Um, and in, and Borges', Borges his Minotaur says, it is true that I never leave my house, but it is also true that its doors whose numbers are infinite, are open day and night. Anyone may enter. Where has she led us? Why are we suddenly in the realm of the Minotaur? Brother Shane, who spends his days alone in the darkness of time, tangled corridors of the brain, of the monstrous, and all no light will touch. He has forgotten bull noon in the palace, ash silver sky, spiced fruit from the garden of Minos, where light throbs and blooms. Beady seeds of the watermelon, blue monkeys gathering saffron, sparkling machinery of the mazy dance, until green silver sunset covers courtyards and colonnades with the soft rug of night. And we have forgotten the serpentine coils of the story, the snake lock sister who forged a rope of knotted light, a way in and way out 
of a man with a sword. So I mentioned the chalice in the poem about the turn of the century, so many, so many artists excited and involved in the image of a woman with a snake. And here is a chalice. This poem is in the shape of a chalice. Um, it's the third one, the third and last one in the shape in a shape poem. And this, this it has um, an epigraph from Psychology Today. Men's fears of women are hidden in plain sight. And um, this poem is called The World in the Shape of My Trainer, Lee Newman, Picks Its Own Snake Goddess. I said, which is more powerful? That tall figure covered in snakes, arms out in front like a sleepwalker, or this smaller one, weightlifting a pair of live snakes, arms up to the side and over her head, like the shoulder press, press exercise you make me do. No question, he said. The first is offering, giving. The other spells danger and menace, showing off her power, her power over me. The serpent leads into the shadows, into the depths, connects the above and below. Number 14, Serpent Queen on the 88 bus. Rock shop, Lily Whites. At the heart of my city, Eros kicks his bare ankle in the air. Piccadilly, I catch the Serpent Queen fixing me with her basilisk stare from a TV ad on the side of a bus, the bus I have just got out of. I remember a circus in a small field outside Skopje and a trapeze artiste with two engorged yellow pythons squeezing her breasts, neck, bare thighs. It took four girls sparkling in swimsuits to lift each one. Why do men want to see naked women fooling with snakes? Venom and muscle, female and male, who's winning? All I know is the snake goddess telling her tale straight to camera in black brocade embroidered in gold. Having died, she tells me, all the way back to the root, I grow again. The serpent of the unconscious has a wisdom of its own and I am the treasure it guards. Wings of her black ruff rise up behind her. Touch her and you'd crackle, you'd shiver, as if the weight of the earth and the power which men, in some dark room of their souls, impute to women, all mean the same thing. Hades, fast cars, undrinkable rivers, and a woman's body at the centre of the world. 15. The Snake Goddess at 3 a.m. Tonight I am riddled by the Lady of the Labyrinth, holding herself like a wine glass, wrangling the serpents of memory, telling how we slipped in the dark through vineyards of the Knossos Valley below the palace. How we danced in the old Ariadne nightclub till the stars closed their eyes. We were young, we were burned by working in sun. We laughed at dangers of the body, dangers of the earth. Her, what are you doing with your life? I can't get rid of her by closing the tab with a swipe up. She rules the maze I find only in dreams. The chaos and glisten and squirm of what lies beneath. Inner monologues I can't keep down as I climb up through those memories to see an autumn rose after rain. Silver drops trembling, nodding its head like someone keeping a tally. 
and I am back with the labyrinth of her gaze, threading down to the long buried taste of the sacred. Honey cakes, cries of the night, whir of frogs and cicadas, new released scent of dry grass. Whatever it takes to get back to her, I'll give.